Thank you for joining us for Mechanics Institute Online and for our program, a conversation between Heather Clark, author of Red Comet, The Short Life and Blazing Art of Sylvia Plath, and Allison McLeod, author of Tenderness, a novel. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at Mechanics Institute. For those of you who are new to the Institute, we were founded in 1854 and we're one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library, an international chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and our Friday night cinema lit film series. Please visit our website for all of our programs and offerings. And we're so pleased to tell you that the library is now open five days a week. So please come down to 57 Post Street in San Francisco and see us. Also, I'd like to mention that our two books uh, by our authors, these two gorgeous books are available for you to purchase either online at alexander.com or at an independent bookstore near you. Today, we're going to celebrate and exalt two of the most iconic, publicized, and controversial writers of the 20th century. These two writers are portrayed in epic works, one a biography about the relationships, inspirations, and ascent and literary achievements of Sylvia Plath, and the other, a work of fiction, The Trials and Tribulations of the Great D.H. Lawrence, uh, closing at the end of his life uh, around Lady Chatterley's lover. These two writers both defy the conventions of their time, and we'll also explore how they intersect. So before we begin, I'd like to introduce our two guests today. Heather Clark earned her bachelor's degree in English literature from Harvard University and a doctorate in English from Oxford University. Her awards include a National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar Fellowship, a Leon Levy Biography Fellowship at the City University of New York, and a visiting U.S. Fellowship uh, at, the, at the Eccles Center for American Studies, the British Library. Um, a former visiting scholar at Oxford Center for Life Writing. She is the author of The Grief of Influence, Sylvia Plath and Ted Hughes, and The Ulster Renaissance, Poetry in Belfast, 1962 to 1972. And her work has appeared in publications including the Harvard Review, the Times Literary Supplement, and she's re recently served as the the scholarly consultant for the BBC documentary, Sylvia Plath, Life Inside the Bell Jar. Uh, the Short Life and Blazing Art of Sylvia Plath was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award and a Pulitzer Prize finalist. And she divides her time between New York and Yorkshire, England, where she is a professor of contemporary poetry at the University of Huddersfield but she's here today from Chappaqua, New York. And Alison McLeod is the author of three novels, The Changeling, The Wave Theory of Angels, and Unexploded, which was long listed for the Man Booker Prize in 2013, a two-story collection. She is a joint winner of the Eccles British Literary Library Writers Award of 2016, and was a finalist for the 2017 Governor General's Award. She is Professor of Contemporary Fiction at the University of Chichester. And then uh, in 2018, she became a visiting professor to, uh, to write full time. And she's joining us from Brighton. So we are so pleased to have these esteemed writers with us today. So please welcome Alison McLeod and Heather Clark. So, ladies, as I mentioned, these two incredibly epic books and really <laughs> totally amazing works. I want to find out from you what what inspired you, what sparked your interest in these two writers, these two iconic writers, and also what moved you forward to 
right in this epic form. So um, we're going to hear from Alison McLeod, McLeod first. Alison. Thanks, Laura. Thanks so much. And, and thank you, everyone who's joined us. Um, I, I'm about to say this evening, as you can see through my window, but thank you for whatever time it is in, in your world at the moment. Um, so, Laura, uh, to pick up on your question, what, what, what took me to D.H. Lawrence, what inspired me to go to an author I had you know, absolutely, like many of us, read in my teens, been inspired by my teens from first coming across him with sons and lovers at school, and then um, moving on through Rain the Rainbow, Women in Love, and Lady Chatterley, I think I went to when I was 17, probably when I wanted to find out, um, cobble together some kind of sexual education for myself, and I thought it might be between those pages. I don't really think it was, but what I discovered instead was one of my earliest experiences of, of feeling moved by a story. So I had read Jane Eyre and the ending of Jane Eyre moved me, but something really shifted within me, this expression of this love affair and the great tenderness of it. And tenderness, uh, some of you may know, was actually, what's well, the title of my novel, but I've, I've um, borrowed it in a sort of form of homage to Lady Chatterley's Lover because it was one of Lawrence's early working titles for his novel, um, which was his, his, last, his last novel of life. So Lawrence, again, many of you will know, um, died at the age of 44 of tuberculosis, died young, and he poured all the last of his energies into Lady Chatterley. It sort of um, represented his philosophy about the, the regeneration of a broken post-war, post-World War I society. Uh, uh, and yet he ran, ran into a problem, in spite of all the leafy greenness and celebration of late Lady Chatterley. Of course, it was very, uh, for the day, and perhaps in some ways for us still today, very sexually explicit. And his publisher, Martin Secker, um, said, no, can't publish it. And so the story began of its banning. My story is the story of its birth, its creation, its life, uh, and its suppression. And eventually its liberation all of those things i've really been long interested in but i wouldn't have written a novel not a, and certainly not a big one uh, as we have here had i not discovered one thing above all that i thought I, that's a novel i discovered a telegram sent by the fbi in 1959 instructing uh, uh, j edgar hoover instructing uh, from, from washington uh, 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 an operative at the Chicago field office to acquire, quote unquote, a copy, a, a, a copy of this highly controversial book. And the Chicago field agent was instructed to be very discreet in that acquisition. So that happened, and, I, and there I am thinking, what on earth would the FBI be wanting with a novel in the middle of the Cold War? So that's, that's, that was the question that propelled me on, and it took me into all sorts of surprising places, uh, through freedom of information requests, through uncovering FBI protocols, and from realizing that at the very time that Lady Chatterley, the novel, is about to be put on trial for obscenity, at that same point, um, at that very point, the Kennedy election is coming up. Kennedy-Nixon 1960 election is on the horizon. And of course, uh, uh, Hoover has his fingers in those pies at the very same time. For me, in my novel, the character Jackie Kennedy, who is a great admirer of Lawrence, um, that's, uh, um, she spent an, at least an hour and a half with the critic Lionel Trilling in 1962, the two of them locked heads, talking all about Lawrence's novels. So this little scene, I'm going to read you just a taste, is um, I, I take the liberty, and this is one calculated liberty I take with uh, a novel I spent six years researching, but in this case, I take what I imagine to be a, a, that conversation between Jackie Kennedy, the great admirer, who had some uncanny similarities at that pre-White House stage with Lady Chatterley. I can see why she m m really might have admired that book. Um, and she's speaking in this, not in 1962, but I've moved the conversation back. So I'm going to give you, I'm, I'm going to truncate it. So I might bump a little bit as I read. I'm trying to just... Um, Ed, I'll just cut it down a little bit as I read. They're in Cape Cod, they're at that, the Kennedy compound in Hyannisport, 
And that's all previously described, so I'm just going to plunge in. So it's Critic Lionel Trilling, 1959, uh, with Jackie Kennedy at that age, 29. She had perhaps an hour before Caroline would come toddling across the, lawn, the wide lawn with her regal grandmother, Rose, and Maud, their aging English nanny, in tow. Jackie cleared the table hastily and returned with her notebook. Thank you for indulging me. She checked her notes. Uh, she, she, sorry, she returned with her notebook. She checked her notes as if she were about to move once again into old interviewer mode. Politics, you say, needs the the imaginative qualities of literature. I, I like that very much, if, if that's not too tried a thing to say. I'm flattered, Mrs. Kennedy. Jack, Jacqueline, please, I, I'm not trying to flatter, I'm trying to understand, by which I mean, please continue. Liberalism, you argue, needs literature's sense of variousness, possibility, complexity. You, you say that in the American metaphysic, reality is always material reality, hard and resistant. Well, it's a relief when one actually agrees with oneself, and he laughs. But she was reaching for something more, staring into the wide, untroubled sky, as if she might draw her question from its resounding blue. Well, how, then, does our native metaphysic evolve into something less hard, something more nuance. How can we as a people come to love variousness and difficulty in the way we do with literature and stories and poetry, when we're in love with modern conveniences and endlessly stray highways and segregated lives? In some ways, it's simple, Mrs. Kennedy. Books, good books, bad books, they're all conversations after all. Dialogues, they're not theses, they're not sermons, they're not ideologies, or novels aren't at least. We need bad books so we can understand the power of good books, good books so we can talk to ourselves, so we can see ourselves as we are, so we come to understand, no, actually to experience in the live unfolding of a story that the reality that others are rarely other. Only with such understanding can our sympathies as a nation state mature. That's just a, a, a little taste of a conversation that's that's unfolding. Um, I'm going to pass over to Heather to introduce you to, to her uh, brilliant exploration of Sylvia Plath. And then we'll come back and we'll be in conversation. I want to keep talking about Lawrence. Um, I'm so <laughs> fascinated by what you've just said and uh, the, the fact that Jackie Kennedy was a huge admirer of Lawrence. I had no idea. And I, I hadn't either. It was just, and I, I needed a bridging character between Lawrence's world and the FBI. It was too, that was too dissonant to bring. And I just, I just thought really, who, who, who might have? Who, and I thought she was a big reader. She had been a reporter, so she would know all about the show trial in 1960. Um, she had wanted to be a writer herself and published in The New Yorker. Mm -hmm. And then I came across in notes by Diana Trilling that that um sh that that's what had brought her together with lionel trilling so oh wow that that is fascinating um i'm we'll so come back when we come yeah, to you know, yeah. and this, you know uh i'm so intrigued by historical fiction and sometimes the line between biography and historical mm. fiction is so porous so um no, yeah. I, I'm just fascinated by what you've said. Thank you. Um, thank you, okay, I'll, okay, thank you, Laura, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, everyone, for, for joining us. Uh, so there have been a lot of biographies of Sylvia Plath. Um, my biography, I think, was the eighth sort of major biography and the 11th biography, <laughs> if you include shorter ones. So something that people always asked me was, why do we need another biography of Sylvia Plath? And my yeah, and I and I sort of became defensive actually. Um, and I felt like I always had to justify the writing of this book to myself and to other people. But my answer really comes down to the fact that uh, there was not the kind of serious scholarly, literary, critical biography um, out there that I felt a writer of her caliber deserved. And there had been several uh, Plath biographies, but I, I felt that 
many of them fell short in different ways. Either they pathologized her mm. or um, they were just really thin on detail. And maybe that wasn't their fault because they had problems with the estate or, you know, we're talking pre-internet research days. So I just, I felt like there was room for the big, <laughs> the big biography about Sylvia Plath. And, and the person who was my sort of biographical inspiration was Hermione Lee and her biography of Virginia Woolf, which was my gold standard. Um, so I always had Hermione Lee's work in the back of my mind as something that I really hope to aspire to. Uh, and there's a Hermione Lee quote that I need to, <laughs> I feel like I need to um, share it with you because that was sort of uh, the guiding premise of, of the biography and the quote is in her very short introduction to biography, which is published by Oxford University Press. And in it, she says, women whose lives have been affected by uh, mental illness, self-harm, suicide, have often been treated biographically as um, psychological cases or victims uh, first and professional writers second. Mm -hmm. And that quote really stuck with me. Mm -hmm. And I felt like that was so true in Sylvia Plath's case, and I, you know, I think she was talking about Virginia Woolf, but it, I felt like it really applied to Plath. So I tried in this book to treat, to always treat Plath as a professional writer first. Mm. And I didn't want to sort of whitewash her struggles with depression. Obviously it's a huge part of her life and a huge part of her story, but I didn't want that to be it. You know, I didn't, sometimes that, that trajectory seemed to take center stage in previous biographies and and uh, and I quote Maggie Nelson in my introduction, Maggie, Maggie Nelson says, to be the Sylvia Plath of anything is a bad thing. And I sort of wanted to try to <laughs> push back on that um, and treat her as, well, I think she's one of the greatest writers of the 20th century. And so I wanted, the, the question that I always had in my mind was how did Sylvia Plath become the writer that she became? was a very simple question, but that's what guided my research and my writing. Um, but of course, I had to do a lot of research about mental health, uh, psychiatry at mid-century. I went to McLean Hospital. I, um, they gave me a tour of the grounds. I interviewed the archivist. I was able to go through their archive. So I had to, I had to learn a lot about many other non-literary topics. Um, but, but I guess it was that sense of maybe anger or injustice that she had been pathologized, that she had sort of become a cliche in a way of, of the hysterical woman writer. Um, the critic Jacqueline Rose has said that, no, no, she says no writer has been more hystericized by the worst of a male tradition than Sylvia Plath. Mm -hmm. So, which I know that's a provocative statement, but, uh, but I saw that in, in some of the biographies. So, I just, I wanted to kind of give her the, the Hermione Lee treatment. <laughs> um, so that was, that was why I, that was why I wrote it. Um, I could, I could read a short section um, of it and we can talk about Lawrence and Sylvia Plath's love of Lawrence in a minute. Uh, um, so one of the things that surprised me when I was writing this book was just how, <laughs> how tough it was for women uh, in the mid fifties. And I, I wasn't quite prepared for the historical reality of that. I thought I knew, and then I, you know, you would read contemporary newspaper accounts or reading Plath's diary and her letters. And it was just, even though she was at Smith college, which was this nurturing, wonderful place for women, there was just obstacle after obstacle thrown up in her way. And I, I had, I gained such a respect for her and how, how much she had to fight to achieve what she did. So let me just read a, a sort of historical <laughs> um, co a section that I hope gives you a sense of the, the difficult times uh, that, that she launched her career. And this is, uh, I'm going to read to you part of Adley Stevenson's speech to the Smith College um, graduating class of 1955. And remember Adley Stevenson, was a Democrat. He was a Democratic presidential candidate. He was a liberal darling. Um, so he said to them, this assignment for you as wives and mothers has great advantages. So when he talks about this assignment, he, he is talking about 
the humble role of the housewife. He tells them they're going to be housewives. And he says, in the first place, it is homework. You can do it in the living room with a baby in your lap or in the kitchen with a can opener in your hands. If you're really clever, maybe you can even practice your saving arts on that unsuspecting man while he's watching television. Stevenson acknowledged, quote, the sense of contraction and the lost horizons, unquote, that these women would feel in their new domestic roles. And he says, once they wrote poetry, now it's the laundry list. They had hoped to play their part in the crisis of the age, but what they do is wash diapers. Stevenson hoped this view was not, quote, too depressing, but he concluded that women never had it as good as you do now. So uh, I just, that's a bit of historical context, which uh, I, I wrote in my introduction, because I, I thought that speech really drove home uh, the, the sexism of the time and um, how, how hard she had to, to work to, to achieve what she did. Amazing, amazing. Thank you for that introduction uh, to both of the books. And I just want to move on to another question, which also, you know, it, you've touched on um, in, in brief, but I'd like to delve deeper. Um, you know, in, in your book, Allison, there's a whole section of, of comments and, from supporters and critics of Lawrence uh, during the trial. And um, that quote from Stephen Spender, uh, who is a poet and an editor of, is it a mag, Encounter is a magazine? Of Encounter, of Encounter, which Encounter. is sort of the, the premier literary journal of the day. Yeah. And he says that Lawrence's book is truthful. And of course, the truth is dangerous. So I'd like to just pose to both of you, you know, what, what truths did both of these authors bear? Uh, what what did they bring? What was underneath? What messages are 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 they bringing forth to the world that was too dangerous for 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 their time? And also, what myths um, did you both want to bust? I think you know, Heather, you you're, you're, you spoke about this a little bit, but I'd like to hear more from both of you. Uh um, it, it's interesting that you selected um, that, Laura, because I was, um, Stephen Spender, in a sense, connected Plath mm -hmm. to Lawrence um, in that he was he was um, the sort of senior poet who got her tickets for the day of the verdict at the infamous 1960 obscenity trial at the Old Bailey in London, the one that was had for the, uh, for let me just grab it for this edition. Um, in uh, the Penguin edition, uh, it's a little original from 1960 that caused the great, great scandal that because it wasn't going to be an expensive edition aimed at gentlemen of means with private libraries. It was going to be sold for three and six, which was the cost of 10 cigarettes. And it meant that, um, that servants, schoolboys, schoolgirls, anyone, housewives with their pin money, could get this book. And that's exactly what Sir Alan Nain of Penguin Publishing intended. But for that reason, he was brought to trial. So this book, going back to um, Spender's comment about explosive or dangerous, well, Lawrence himself in 1928, oh, as he was right finishing it, 1927, um, wrote to who he hoped would be his publisher, Martin Secker, and said, it's a, it's a bit of a revolution, it's a bit of a bomb. Uh, and Lawrence was a bomb thrower. He was born in 1885, he was essentially born a Victorian, but very much at odds with the culture, the milieu of a small mining community in which he grew. So this book, and, and incidentally, because I've, um, uh, more or less in the States with you at the moment. This, I, this never gets said. This is the 1959 Grove Press New York edition, which is made to look very sober and very almost scholarly and, you know, very proper. Um, and the reason the FBI was pursuing this book is because they were pursuing Barney Rossett of Grove Press, who is what we would now call a diverse publisher, but was publishing um, homosexuals, uh, explicit books, Europeans, um, uh, people of very, you know, various minorities, wherever he was interested in publishing, breaking the mainstream. So uh, it, it was completely natural for him to take on Lady Chatterley. But the book, 
in my view, Laura, is, is it's the reason it's, I mean, it's da it's now dated in some ways. It absolutely is. Some of the conversations are dated. There's something huge, life affirming that transcends all that, and there's still danger in it, in my view, because um, Lawrence Lawrence gives expression to the body and uh, human 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 correspondence, human human intercourse at every level. It's human intercourse that is rendered there with a kind of honesty that is still actually quite surprising and quite radical today for fiction writers on the page. We all know that sex can write badly. He really took risks with that and he pushes it to a certain, certain in, intimacy that is still fresh and, and um, you know, makes me sort of um, go, God, look at, the, look at the daring of that on the page. For Lawrence, the notion of tenderness wasn't sentimental. It wasn't um, just about some nice cuddly feeling. For him, tenderness, the reason it's so central to Lady Chatterley is because it was um, Mellors, Oliver Mellors, the gamekeeper says, I, st I stand for the touch of bodily awareness between human beings and I stand for the touch of tenderness. And for Lawrence, tenderness was achieved as a kind of coming through, coming through shame, coming through the darker impulses forced upon perhaps us all at some point by strictures and hypocrisies. It, so it's about the vulnerabilities, the fallibilities, the shame, and about pushing through all that to honest human expression at every level from conversation to the body. And that for Lawrence, a T tenderness was wrapped up in something quite complex, human sympathy, but human sympathy born of genuine contact. Um, so that's what caused the, the, the bomb to go off with this book. And it went off first in the States with Grove Press when uh, J. Edgar Hoover sent in agents to um, confiscate uh, boxes in a Washington DC bookshop and have them locked up as evidence and it went on from there right through the appeals court and Hoover wanted Rossett taken down. He, they had a huge file and when I, of course, I'm at the time I'm researching and thinking, yeah, you know, of course he had a huge file on un-American activity, but we now know that as well at the very same time Hoover was covertly monitoring uh, over 250 senators and congressmen, including the Kennedys, and uh, over, well, the estimates go between 200,000 and 10 million private American citizens. So within a democracy, we've got citizens spying on citizens. And uh, for me, tenderness above all is about, I suppose for me, my, my real concern was liberal democracy and how precious and how fragile it is. And it was you know, concerns today that made me um, look back to 1960, concerns today around surveillance, concerns today around banning, and that made me go back to this story. Oh, Sorry, that's, that's, not, that's yeah. a long answer. <laughs> well, you know, I think Sylvia Plath, Lawrence was always such a touchstone for her. And Laura, you asked about truth and, and what kinds of truth maybe Plath was trying to tell. And, and I think I think I have to mention Lawrence in my answer because she started reading Lawrence um, in high school, but she also read him in college. She had read almost all of Lawrence's novels by 1956. People think that Ted Hughes um, sort of introduced her to Lawrence, but he didn't. And, and she, she was obsessed with, <laughs> with Lawrence. She writes in her journals all about him. She writes about reading his novels and, and she feels so attuned to his female characters. And so by the time she meets Ted Hughes, she's sort of, and I argue in one of my, my second book that Lawrence was sort of what brought them together in a way that, that both of them were so um, almost in love with Lawrence's works that, that it, it, he was just a natural uh, bridge between them. So I wanted to read just a, a short quote, um, which gets at this idea of the, what kinds of truths maybe Plath wanted to, um, to tell. And, and I, I think maybe the first answer that comes to mind is that in Ariel, her, her last 
uh, poetry collection, she told, I think she, she tried to tell the truth about women's lives and that had not really been done before. Um, she introduced anger into the female poetic lexicon. She wrote honestly and unsentimentally about motherhood, which is still a subject that is sent deeply sentimentalized, at least here in America, I think. And it's starting to change, but, but like you, uh, Allison, when you read, go back and read Lady Chatterley and you still feel like it's radical, when I read Plas Poems of Motherhood, I still feel yeah. like, oh, this is so honest. And I, she's one of the few people I feel like who writes uh, in, in that way, the, you know, the joys, but also the, the difficulties mm. and the, the harsh, uh, sometimes harsh realities. But just to bring Lawrence back into the conversation, um, I'll read you, a, this is from a letter that Plath wrote to, I think it's to her mother. Um, yeah, so when Ted won this big poetry contest, uh, Marion Moore was one of the judges. And um, this is in 1957. And Marion Moore wanted Ted to take two poems out of the, the book because they were both sort of more sexually explicit. So Plath is furious about this and, and she writes to her mother. And uh, I'll just read you a snippet from this letter because she mentions Lawrence. Um, we feel strongly that to cut these two poems out would be to silence a large part of Ted's voice, which is raised against the snide, sneaking, coy weekend review poets whose sex is in their head and the prissy abstract poets who don't dare to talk about love in anything but mild distant abstractions. It is Dylan Thomas, but with a faith and deep religious morality, which is also Lawrence, both misunderstood by many blind people. Ironically enough, I opened Marianne Moore's book of critical essays to see if she ever treated poets who wrote about sex directly and honestly. And the page fell open to this letter from D.H. Lawrence to Miss Moore when she edited the dial. And quoting Lawrence, now Plath is quoting Lawrence. I knew some of the poems would offend you, but then some part of life must offend you too. And even beauty has its thorns and its nettle stings and its poppy poison. Nothing is without offense and nothing should be if it is part of life and not merely abstraction. And then we're back to Plath. Naturally, Ted and I agree with Lawrence. I think he puts his finger on her blind spot most eloquently. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's just a little, I mean, it, there's so much about Lawrence in Plath, but I, that I hope gives you a, a sense of how important he, he his truth telling was to her. Um, and, and so, so yeah, I could go on, but I, he was so he was such a touchstone for Sylvia Plath. Could could I could I just share with you off a tiny little lines? I love um, Heather. Just I think you'll oh, yeah. enjoy the, yeah. just a few lines. Um, I just came across this is what is it? 1958, 1958, February 23rd, 1958, and um, it's very quick. And she just says. Um, um, today, from today from coffee till tea time at six, I read in Lady I read Lady Chatterley's Lover, drawn back again with the joy of a woman living with her own gamekeeper, and women in love and sons and lovers. Love, love. Why do I feel I would have known and loved Lawrence? How many women must feel this and be wrong? <laughs> she's right. she's right on that. I opened the rainbow, which I've never read, and was sucked into the concluding Ursula and Skrebensky episode and sank back, breath knocked out of me, as I read of their London hotel, their Paris trip, their riverside loving while Ursula studied at college. This is the stuff of my life, my life different but no less brilliant and splendid. And the flow of my story will take me beyond this in my way. Arrogant? I felt mystically that if I read Lawrence, re sorry, if I read Wolf, read Lawrence, their vision so different is so like mine. I can be itched and kindled to a great work. So she's she's amazing, isn't she? I love I love that. Yeah, and she actually wrote she wrote a paper about Lawrence at Cambridge, and she she rhapsodizes about Lady Chatterley's yeah. Lover as well. Yeah, and and you know yeah. Ted Hughes, if somebody. Well, I, I won't get into the, the was she a feminist, was she not a yeah. feminist argument, because it's just, you know. <laughs> but Ted Hughes always said she was Laurentian, she wasn't women's lib, which I'm, I'm not saying I agree with that, but that was always his take on. Sylvia I think that's Plath. what I, I feel too, that would have been her starting impulse, yeah. would yeah. have been her, 
her natural grounding place. Yeah, yeah. Laurentian, not so. Yeah. yeah, he was he was just an enormous presence in their lives, and she used to always talk about how she and Ted wanted to travel all over Europe because they wanted to be like Frida and Lawrence. Yes, they, yeah, they just had those two in their in their yeah. mind, and then of course they had children, and it wasn't really that. Wasn't Went to Devon that. instead. <laughs> they couldn't go out to New Mexico or no. Italy or that kind of no. thing. So. Exactly, and Lawrence. Um, uh, I think always had a sense, in fact, Ian Forster said this of Lawrence, that Lawrence knew that he wouldn't find acceptance within his own time, mm -hmm. that he looked, um, Ian Forster said this in Lawrence's obituary, that uh, uh, Lawrence always knew it would be the young who would pick him up um, mm -hmm. that it, and, and make sense of him and understand. Yeah, and she was obviously in that, and I place in my novel, well, uh, Plath is in my novel, Moving Through Cambridge, um, near the end of my book, and uh, around the time of the trial. But I also, uh, I also uh, imagine um, a, lit, a trilling reading that little bit from Forster uh, to Jackie Kennedy, because she clearly was of that generation that felt his influence. And interestingly, going back to your point, Laura, uh, so going back to your point, Heather, about um, housewives and that terrible, terrible Adlai Stevenson yeah. speech. Jackie yeah. Kennedy in the year her yearbook um, mm -hmm. from Farmington, a uh, sc school for girls. Uh, her uh, her ambition, her uh, primary ambition, in the yearbook stated sh not to be a housewife. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then she became, of course, housewife to the nation, and just, uh, she Wait. she hated title first lady she said it sounds like a saddle horse yeah. so it's interesting the connections yeah but the connections are so so it's just very visceral you can just just feel feel this deep connection that they had and in fact um i want to just talk about that the, how they actually intersected because sylvia did attend the obscenity trial and uh, Heather, do you want to just talk about that a little bit? And we'll both talk about that. How 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 did that how did they connect in that way? Yeah, I mean, she and I, I you know, Allison, you can uh, talk more about this or, or correct me if I get the details wrong. But but yeah, Stephen Spender got her a ticket to the Old Bailey <laughs> um, on on November second, and it was yeah, that was the last day of the trial, and so she. She of course was on Lawrence's side, and uh, and 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 I, you know, I just sort of talked about how part of her entire poetic philosophy, really, some of it at least, comes from Lawrence. So she took notes. She scribbled all of these notes in her journal, and some of these notes uh, have, were included in the the published journals. So um, she. Yeah, she 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 wrote about I'm just reading from my own biography here. Um, she wrote to her psychiatrist, actually, Sylvia Plath wrote to her psychiatrist uh, about her surprise. She was actually surprised by the not guilty verdict um, because she <laughs> she she felt like the uh, the, the jury was just, she says, they were unpromising, prosperous, middle-class looking jury. <laughs> so she's sort of snobby about the jury, but uh, so she was surprised by the, the, the verdict. Um, and so, but she was very happy. She recorded uh, the Bishop, let's see, she recorded- Bishop of Mrs. yeah. Yeah, Mrs. Bennett of, of Girton College, Cambridge. She recorded her saying, quote, physical life is important and is being neglected. People live poor and emasculated lives, living with half of themselves. A marriage can be broken when it is unfulfilled. And, and that's something that Plath really took to heart. I think for her, sex was sacred. It was not this sort of Bloomsbury, you know, more informal type of arrangement. It was holy, it was sacred. And that's part of the reason why I think when the marriage broke up, it was, so devastating because they had had this Laurentian bond, right? They've, and a lot of their friends said, "Oh, it's just a, a bourgeois affair. Just it'll it'll blow over. Ted will Ted will come back to you. Don't worry." But for her, because the marriage and the sex, it was all Laurentian. This was a world shattering event, right? This infidelity. So I think a lot of that does go back to Lawrence. Mm, yeah, his whole philosophy of 
uh, of, for him healing society in, in Lawrence's view, but uh, well, in many people's view, England post World War One was absolutely traumatized as a as as a culture and a society and politically it was stunted. It was atrophied. It was broken. The the sort of slaughter on the fields of France, and for him, the renewal of the nation began with. Um, he uh, uh, open, healthy, green, fertile mm. relations between man and woman, mm. and you know, and then you know, there's questionable things we can bring in about Lawrence's views, uh, you know, around and uh, non non heterosexual relationships. I mean, we, we you know, then Lawrence begins to slide down slippery slopes, um, to say the least. But his philosophy, even though even though in his own marriage, which is something. I explored um, at the end of his life. It's, it, he's really funny because um, he he's, he's very much behind marriage. He's almost more behind the notion of marriage, the concept of marriage, and he sticks very faithfully to Frida, um, but at the same time feels he cannot curb her, her natural appetites. And Frida had really countless affairs um, near the end of his life, laterally, with one, one particular man. But, you know, she would say, oh, but Lorenzo, the woodcutter across the river looked very lonely. So when you're off at the market, I swam across the river. Well, why did it? Well, he looked lonely. <laughs> so, you know, this was and, and, and Lawrence, uh, while he raged and seethed and felt humiliated um, at the same time, never tried to curb. He felt this, you know, it is not for me to curb nature. But he himself only had one extramarital affair in his lifetime. And this was the great discovery for me Another in my sort of um, six years of uncovering and research and detectiving was uh, that because most people assume that Lady Chatterley is in fact, you know, is a, it's a love letter to Frida. And maybe in some ways that's true. But there was a woman called Rosalind Baines with whom he had his only extramarital affair in September 1920 and that gave rise to his poetic sequence this, um, in Birds, Beasts and Flowers, the initial poems in that collection which are highly erotically charged. He turned her away, although I think she was at quite a vul vul vulnerable point on the brink of divorce with three little girls. I think she must have really been quite hurt but seemingly very gracious and uh, he um, wrote the poems in those three weeks, carried on writing them afterwards, published them in 1922. And then all of the evidence, all Lady Chatterley's appearance, um, her biography, so much of what, that she loves the Sussex Downs is all Rosalind Baines. And yet she is the kind of unspoken secret because it was more convenient for the Lawrences if the world thought this is a love letter to my wife. So that was that was fascinating. Um, unpeeling those those the almost the what lies behind the brush stroke or the pen strokes of creation. Yeah, yeah, and it and it made me think actually about Hughes and and I think he had a a different interpretation of Lawrence than than maybe Plath did in in that way because I think for him. You know, and, and of course, he is a great admirer of Lawrence, and a lot of his poetry was deeply, deeply influenced by Lawrence's poetry. But for Hughes, he felt like, well, I have these desires, and I'm not going to repress them. That's, yeah, and yeah. that, and for him, that was Laurentian. It, it, where, and, and it's the great yeah. contradiction in Lawrence and his philosophy in that, uh, or, I, or I can see that. I think I would I would be plath like, and I would take yeah. it that way. It's holy, it's sacred, it's a yeah, bond between yeah. us, but. Yeah. Also, and this is what um, Lawrence actually says to Rosalind Baines that first night they're together, and, so, and she records it in her diary, or later in her memoir, rather. And he speaks about sex being element, uh, elemental and impersonal, that you, we have to get away from the ego. So sexual appetite, which is clearly what he was persuading of himself, himself of with Frida in terms of her affairs, that, that it's part of this elemental force that moves through us and one mustn't get too ego bound or get sort of more or less hurt feelings about it um, and so on the one hand you can think it's a sacred meeting of two souls conjoined and that feels yeah. very personal that's yeah. Laurentian but at the same time Lawrence was so good with contradictions because great truths are contradictory 
And at the same time, it was this impersonal, which I think I, if you're Ted Hughes, you know, there is that, 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 that nature moves through us with force and something far beyond our, you know, our human daily egotistical reach. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They were, they were sort of coming at Lawrence from these opposite yeah. angles in a way and it, it yeah. blew up. And, and the clash, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. You know, uh, yeah, in both on their own in their own right, I'd like to just also find out, you know, because they both did, neither of them lived a hugely long life. Um, I, I'd like to find out more about the trajectory of their notoriety. What what work of theirs do you feel was the turning point or something that really uh, brought them out? Uh, that really was a, a, a change maker in terms of their writing career and achievements. Well, for, for Lawrence, it, um, his great notoriety really began, I mean, it began, it had flutters, it had, you know, it was, um, an early work called The Prussian Officer, when he was almost banned from lending libraries, but really, um, he, his reputation hit the skids in 1915 with publication of The Rainbow um, and the immediate uh, confiscation of it, the banning of it, and eventually the burning of it in 1915, all 1,011 copies in London by, um, by actually by the hangman of the, of, the, of the magistrate's court. And he read about it. He read, a, he read about it um, in the Manchester Guardian. He hadn't been informed of its fate. Um, he later hit notoriety again with um, uh, well, I mean, it, it, it went on. Women in Love in, was banned in the States. Uh, he then had an exhibition of paintings because he also, at the time he was writing Lady Chatterley, he, he had always drawn and he used to be a teacher of, of, of art and drawing uh, at boys' school. And he always drew from boyhood. And he went back to painting at the time he was living outside Florence in Italy and writing Lady Chatterley. He'd write in the mornings from about 8 a.m. In the, in the wood behind this remote villa. And in the afternoons, he would paint. And that exhibition, uh, those, that series of paintings, which included nudes, the Holy Family is a nude Holy Family. Um, it, it featured pubic hair, which was the great offence. And so the police, Scotland Yard, came in and confiscated all the paintings with pubic hair. And uh, they were not destroyed, but only on the condition that they were never shown in England again. His lawyer agreed to it, but Lawrence, who was then really ill with fever, tubercular fever in Florence, was raging that the lawyer should have agreed those terms that the paintings would never be shown in his own country again. And then, of course, we hit Lady Chatterley, the obscenity trial. And as, as Heather noted, um, Plath was surprised it wasn't a not guilty verdict. I think now, I mean, even, uh, you know, in me as a sort of academic, I, like most, had assumed it was pretty well... Um, you know, an open and, open and closed case that it was, of course, it was going to win the day. It was 1960. It wasn't 1860. But in fact, that trial was on such a knife edge for so many reasons. And um, the odds were very much against it. The judge was nakedly biased against the book, nakedly subjective and kept intervening. The prosecution were determined to bring that book down. Hoover from Washington was actually aiding the prosecution in London um, and trying to facilitate in whatever way possible. So the odds that uh, the, when I've I spent um, months and months in, with the defense papers and the prosecution papers, and it's absolutely moving to see the degree of work and commitment the defense put into it to win that day, but it was no easy win. And Alan Lane, again, it's forgotten to history, um, Alan Lane not only faced an un unlimited fine, but could have had three years in prison. Nobody would rule that out. So it was just, it was a new test case because the law had changed a bit. So, but nobody would say, no, that's, you know, that's definitely not going to happen. And his family was in court that day, worried on the day of the verdict that he could be sent down, down. So, so Lawrence's reputation had these waves of scandal and to some extent he courted it um, and then he was briefly to summarize he then became you know the 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 the, the, the defense they won the day on november 2nd 1960 it ushered in along with the pill and so on other things the uh, the decade of free love lawrence was its um its hero its poster boy if you like even even long you know even 30 years dead 
And then 1970, we had Kate Millett, Sexual Politics, which had been her thesis in which she examines um, the roots of, of power and patriarchy in the work of um, a, a few key male writers, uh, D.H. Lawrence being one of them. And he enters into controversy again, so that by the time I arrive at university um, uh, in the 80s, uh, he's, off the, he's off the curriculum. And so to some extent, I wanted to, along with, uh, coincidentally, a few other female writers this year um, and upcoming, want, I think I'm just of the age where I thought, I can do this now. I, I'm now confident enough and able enough to, to go back to Lawrence and say, actually, very few male writers write women like Lawrence does or, or gives the attention to female consciousness on the page. So um, there, there, there are suspect things. There are, you know, I'm not going to be a complete apologist, but uh, there's something so powerful. Susan Gilbert, um, also a female critic, Adair Sning, come back and say, Lawrence does women like few others, even women. You know, he's, he stands there um, remarkable for his rendering of female consciousness. Yeah, and it, uh, Francis Wilson's new biography uh, of Lawrence Burning Man, I read an, I can't remember if it was an interview, but, or maybe it was her, in her introduction, she says something similar, like, I felt like now I could do Lawrence. Yes, I, and uh, interestingly, we've done events here together, and she is, we are the same age. Oh, right, okay. So I just think that's it, and she yeah. said as well, she hit university loving Lawrence, as I did. Yeah. And, and um, and I just thought, well, where's Lawrence? Why, you know? And there was a whole sense of no, we're not talking about Lawrence anymore. Mm. You know, that was fine for school for sons and lovers, but you know, <laughs> I mean, it wasn't stated. But he was just suddenly nowhere, and I didn't understand that. Yeah. Well, Sylvia Plath would not have understood it either. I think. No, she wouldn't. <laughs> if, she, she wouldn't. if she had lived. <laughs> oh, um, I, I mean, I don't mean to laugh when I say that, but I just she he was so important to her. And I think she would have been surprised by I think she would. that he was, you know, off the, the syllabi and it, it would have troubled her deeply. But what you're doing, Heather, is so interesting because, you know, around rescuing Plath from this hystericization uh, of, of, of reputation. And I'll just, just briefly say this, uh, um, I, I ended up, which was my great good fortune, um, in, in a taxi briefly with Gloria Steinem in, in, in India. And I, I, I was just dazzled, of course. But very briefly, I think because Virginia Woolf appeared in my last novel, and, um, and I live very close to where she drowned herself and all those things. But Gloria Steinem said to me, I think she was at Smith, I think, Gloria, um, yeah. Gloria are you out there? Um, and, and, she, and she said that that's one of the things that made her angry was that Wolf and, and Plath were always presented as, so before they were poets or writers, they were hysterical women, there were studies in hysteria. So what you're doing is um, amazing. To well, it, thank, you, thank you. I mean, I, I, it just, and it bothered me that, that the suicide had been, um, you know, just took up so much oxygen in the story. And I felt like it didn't, the male writers who died by suicide weren't necessarily as negatively mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. overshadowed by that, that particular legacy. And uh, so, so yeah, I just, I wanted to, to talk about her, her present her as uh, as a writer and not you know obsessed not a writer that was obsessed with death but <laughs> someone who was obsessed with art and yeah. and and someone who wanted to be a great poet from the time she was eight years old yeah. and um, in and Laura you asked about uh, sort of turning points and you know yeah. she she never had the kind of fame in her lifetime that of course she has now and. She, she published quite widely. I mean, she was publishing in 17 and Mademoiselle and these big American uh, women's magazines when she was just out of high school and in college. And she had a real reputation as a campus poet. And, and her first um, published collection, The Colossus, uh, it, it got good reviews, but you know, it didn't win any prizes. It, it sold 500 copies um, and, it, and it sort of, it, it sort of dwindled into a minor obscurity in, a, in during that time. And uh, her aerial poems, many editors rejected them. The editor of The New Yorker 
was somebody who she Maybe. kept sending them to him uh, in 1962, early 1963. She kept sending Howard Moss all of these, wow. some of the greatest poems of the 20th century. They were just too much for the New Yorker, right? The New Yorker was still a kind of a coffee table <laughs> magazine. And um, but but there were some some editors who accepted them. So she wasn't howling in the wilderness, but it really was Ariel, which was published posthumously. Um, that secured her reputation uh, was published in 1965. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the bell jar, I sometimes I, I, I tend to think of her <laughs> so much as a poet, but I love the bell jar as well. And that's the book that most people come to um, when they first encounter Plath. It's it for a long time, I think it was a staple in American high schools. I'm not sure about that anymore. Uh, but uh, but that was published in early 1963. And and under a pseudonym and and again and people are often surprised by this that that was not a bestseller you know it was it got again it got good reviews but she i think was she wished that it had gotten better reviews and um so that book as well what we now consider an american classic it was not seen as such at the time and in fact knopf rejected it um, and Harper and Rowe rejected. They both of these New York publishers rejected the Bell Jar right before her suicide. And I sort of theorize in the book that 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 news of these American rejections really, yeah. uh, you know, that wasn't a good thing for her to hear when she was already in the throes of a severe depression. Mm -hmm. so, but it was really Ariel, I think, that secured her reputation. Great, thank you. Well, I just see a, a question or two in the audience. So uh, Pam, would you come on and we can read off some of the questions from you, our uh, viewers out there? Yes, um, the first question I see is from Eugene Neiman. How do you gauge Sylvia's reputation today? Also, please contrast Sylvia with Anne Sexton. Oh, um, okay. I think I think today uh, her reputation is as strong as it's ever been. Um, I think you know when I started writing this book ten years ago, the the plath myth and the doom and gloom and the hystericization and all of that I think was stronger and it it made me kind of angrier and it provided the impetus to to write this book. Now, 10 years later, after Me Too, right, the Me Too movement and all of this, I do feel that we've we've turned a corner and we're we're more sensitive about the ways in which we talk about women who have struggled with mental illness. Um, so, but I and I also think that her poetic reputation is quite strong. There are so many uh, brilliant academics writing about Sylvia Plath right now. Uh, and I think it's it's trickling down. <laughs> um, I think she's she's treated with a lot of respect in the, the poetry uh, circles that, you know, the, the scholarly circles that I move in. I study poetry um, for a living. I don't write poetry, but um, I'm sort of a historian of poetry. So I think it's quite strong. Um, as for Anne Sexton, this is what I'm writing my next book on um, the Boston years of Sylvia Plath, Anne Sexton, Adrian Rich, and Maxine Cuman. And they all were living in Boston at the same time. They were all there in 1958, 59, 60. And so it's like a group, little group biography of that time and place. And Anne Sexton, um, I increasingly, as I do this research, I increasingly think that Anne Sexton was incredibly important for Sylvia Plath's poetic development. They were very different in terms of their disposition. Sylvia Plath was Germanic and sober and um, hardworking and, and very kind of put together. Uh, and Sexton, and, and, I'll, and I'll, of course, Sylvia Plath was very educated, right? She was one of the, she, she graduated summa cum laude from Smith. And Sexton did not go to college. And Sexton uh, had um, a lot of, um, you know, she was addicted to pills and alcohol, and she had a sort of shambolic um, life in a, in, compared to Plath in a lot of ways in, in the late 50s. And she really struggled to take care of her children. Her children were always at her mother-in-law's house. And so in their dispositions, they were almost like complete opposites. 
but they were br both brilliant poets and they both wanted to become great poets and kind of break through um, the obstacles that were put in front of them. And they both took Robert Lowell's creative writing class in Boston in 1959. And just to wrap up, because I'm sorry, I'm going on about this because this is what I'm like, I'm currently writing about, but yeah. So she, her poems about depression and suicide and mental illness and mental hospitals, I think her poetry sort of gave Plath permission to start writing about those things because she hadn't really engaged with those subjects in her poetry yet. And she still felt, I think, a sense of taboo. And Anne Sexton, I think, and Robert Lowell really Helped, helped push her in the direction that Ariel eventually took. So I think we owe Anne Sexton a lot. <laughs> Great. Uh, the next question is from Lucille Sutton. How do you treat Ted Hughes in your bio? It's hard to like him when we read about his behavior towards Sylvia Platt. Yes, I mean, this is something that comes up all the time. And, and actually I wrote my, my second book was about Ted Hughes and Sylvia Plath and their their poetic relationship because I was fascinated that in in my opinion two of the the great post war poets in it, writing in English in the twentieth century were married to each other mm -hmm. for over six years and I just I wanted to know how that worked you know and how they influenced each other and and so in in my second book I really stuck to the work and I stuck to <laughs> uh literary critical modes of examining their work and i tried to stay away from biography in a way although it, it is biographical but i couldn't do that in in red comment i had to i had to take the biography head on and uh and it was very difficult um and so i'm someone who's a great admirer of ted hughes's poetry and uh i i tried I tried to, I'm, I'm interested in their relationship almost more intellectually um, than I am biographically and what they learned from each other and what they stole and what they, um, what they took away from that. But it was very difficult writing the, the last half when he, you know, the marriage was devolving and he was having an affair with Asia Wevel and she was alone with two young children and writing these searing letters to her psychiatrist. And, uh, and it was just emotionally for me, it was very draining. Um, but I also had, you know, I feel like it's always difficult to get inside another person's marriage. Um, mm -hmm. So I, you know, I tried to give, I tried to quote <laughs> a lot in those sections when you'll, you'll notice that there's more heavy quotation in some of the more um, fraught sections. I kind of, I wanted readers to, to read their their original words and just take what they you know wanted to take away from that i saw um ted hughes read when i was in my 20s and i i i suddenly had an understanding of i think it was eileen feinstein said that once she she met him and and she found him so overpowering overpower overpoweringly attractive that she had to go into the loo and throw up <laughs> i thought it was quite the line and then i mean i was in my I don't know, I might have been 30, and he was in his 70s, and uh, he was like granite. He was like this, yeah. you know, being from the stage with Seamus Heaney. And oh, it was wow. very touching because his, if ever he was trying to host the evening and just speak, and his hands were shaking, mm -hmm. um, Heaney was a complete natural and easygoing. Uh, he was, his, whenever he just had to speak in his own voice, the audience was, was nervous, this great oh. hulk of a man. Um, and, and but as soon as he started to read his poems, all the shaking stopped. But he was a, a four, you know, even in his mid late seventies, an absolute. I, I had a sense of that. Right, I can I can see how you had a sort of force amongst women. He, you know, he was a, a power on that stage that night. Yeah, that's a lot of uh, you. You hear that quite a bit, and, and yeah. that um, his cragginess and, and, his, and the comparison to Heathcliff comes up. Yeah, the yeah, there there was something unusual, um, I would say, in, in, in his his presence. Yeah. Um, okay, Jay before, Davis. We, before we wrap, is there any other questions out yes. there? Yes. Yes. Well, okay, questions. go ahead. Um, Jay Davis has asked, could you talk about Eddie Cohen, one of the most interesting characters in the book? Oh, wasn't he? Yes, I loved uh, writing about Eddie Cohen. He was uh, this sort of a beatnik <laughs> fan. He wrote Plath a fan letter 
when he uh, read one of her stories in 17. And they just started this amazing correspondence. And mo most of what survives is from Eddie Cohen to Plath, but a couple of her letters survive. Um, and they just, they had this sort of Laurentian correspondence, actually. They just talked about sex and love and, and politics and, and the Cold War and Korea and Eisenhower. I mean, it was, it was very dramatic, the, these letters. Um, and he was a brilliant writer as well. So they just kind of, it was fireworks, epistolary fireworks. And they had a falling out when he, he actually came to visit her and he didn't tell her he was showing up. And she didn't like that. She didn't like being surprised. He came to visit her from Chicago and she, he had only existed on the page for her. And then when he showed up in person, she just, she just kind of shut down. It, it was too much. Um, and she was by her own admission, quite rude to him. And he just turned around and drove back to Chicago. And so <laughs> I think he had hope, been hoping for a romance, but um, I, I think she had shared too much with him in a way. Uh, so that it was it was okay when she was just speaking into a void, but not necessarily ready to to have a real friendship. They then they kept writing to each other for a little longer, and um, and the the relationship petered out, but it ended up still amicable. Okay, good, great. Well, be before we wrap up, I'm going to just put the last two questions together. Um, to get your responses about um, what were the effects on the status of women uh, that both of these writers brought to bear uh, and also to freedom ex of expression. And also if you have a favorite poem or one of a favorite book of these writers, uh, please share that with us. Um, so on the freedom of, ex or freedom of women, there's um, a line that I'm going to I'm going to get probably slightly wrong, but it's a, a wonderful line that someone says to Lady Chatterley um, at, at the early stages of Lady Chatterley's lover when she's struggling with her unhappy marriage and the complete staleness of it and the stagnation of it, and um, an, an older woman says to her, "If a woman does not live her life, she must." she must learn to live to repent it. So, for, so the whole notion in 1928 of a woman living her life also uh, reminded me when Heather was speaking about the sort of anger around motherhood that Plath allows herself to express. And I wonder, I was wondering as you spoke, if uh, she was influenced by Lawrence, who um, is someone who did give expression uh, in, in the 20s to that, which was quite radical, mm -hmm. as did his great friend Catherine Mansfield. And they sort of communicated around such themes. And it was so taboo um, in uh, Catherine Mansfield's stories like At the Bay, you get a character called Linda just wanting her children to be. I mean, she really it's very clear she's not a natural mother. And in somebody like a story I absolutely love. And for the moment, I'll say it's my my, well, my favorite Lawrence short story, The Rocking Horse Winner, which is based on Cynthia, As Cynthia Asquith and the little boy who goes into a trance on his rocking horse in his nursery. And, um, and the walls are whispering, uh, not enough money, not, the family doesn't have enough money, they're wealthy and they're running out of money. So, but in that story, there's a very clear depiction of maternal ambivalence and, and repressed anger around the children. So I found that quite fascinating in terms of representing women's lives. Freedom of expression, um, I, I think it just goes back to this notion of, of artists needing to be bomb throwers. And actually, I, I think at the end of the American edition of my book, I quote, um, JFK giving the um, the eulogy at the funeral of Robert Frost um, and speaking to this very idea that writers and artists cannot be cooperative, that, we're, that, that society is at peril if we curb and control our writers and artists, that to some extent um, within those explosions lie the life the healthy lifeblood of society and i think it's a question today when we hear about beloved being a point of discussion for banning um i'm going to get the state wrong I, i've read about it peripherally here in the uk there's absolutely a kind of creep uh, a kind of cr nothing so overt as the banning of a book right now but a creep coming in 
a, um, a, uh, where the, this government is increasingly, this conservative government increasingly trying to control what museums are doing to investigate the legacies of slavery within England. And this government is pushing back and trying to control who gets appointed to trusts of those museums. Also in schools, um, the government is increasingly having control here around what novels are appropriate to be teaching at schools level. And it, so it's nothing as overt and blatant as the banning of a single book, um, but it's a, it's a stealthy creep coming in that, uh, that is there on an almost monthly basis. So um, Lawrence, Lawrence would have um, raged, essentially. He would have just raged. <laughs> yeah, and, and you talk about bomb throwing. What, I think the, the, the Plath line that comes to mind, um, which I'm sure you know, you, you all, you're all thinking of as well, is daddy, daddy, you bastard, I'm through. Mm -hmm. From, from her, her famous and controversial poem, Daddy, which is an aerial. And that, that became almost an anthem of the women's movement in the 1970s. And just this rejection of patriarchy that poem was so influential, I think, historically for the women's movement. And it's come under incredible fire um, for many, many reasons. And there are academic articles written <laughs> about yeah. it. And then yeah. there, you know, so there's there's dodgy imagery. And, uh, but, but that line, I think, mm -hmm. really galvanized mm -hmm. a movement. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think of, um, a lesser known work perhaps is Plas Three Women. And it's it was a ra radio play. It was meant to be a radio play. It was read out loud on the BBC. And she she taught she follows the the lives of three women who give birth. Um, the first is a mother who who has a son and is very closely based on Plath herself. But even though she has a healthy child, the mother is still kind of racked with worry. It's like this existential <laughs> um, anxiety. The second mother has a miscarriage and the third mother gives her baby up for adoption. So Plath goes, she, she discusses um, these three experiences. And I just, again, I, I, I think it was so radical for the time, early 1960s. I think it's still radical and you know, Plath, came of age in a, in a time when you didn't even say the word pregnant on network television. Mm. And here she's writing about miscarriages and she's, she's talking about it on the BBC. So yes. I think she helped open up um, that, that debate and, and it, in a way that's part of her, her bomb throwing. <laughs> I would just wish she had lived to see, um, lived to see what, what her poems you know, brought in a way. Well, Allison, did you have any other last? Oh, I, I was just going to um, to add to that about the pregnant that in in the trial in 1960 about pregnancy being pregnant being a an, an unsayable word, and of course Lady Chatley is full of unsayable words, and in the trial the prosecution pulled out almost a grocery list of, and I won't repeat them all here, but <laughs> 42 of this. I mean, literally just to scandalise the jury, but amongst that whole long list of the word counts from um, uh, from Chatterley um, were, were the words womb and and the word inside as oh. well was on their list oh my god yeah. wow mm. amazing well I want to thank uh, Heather Clark and Alison McLeod for their inspiring and illuminating conversation about Sylvia Plath and D.H. Lawrence once again Everyone, please pick up these books, Red Comet and Tenderness. Um, just brilliant. Um, I, I hope we get to talk with you again. We could just go on and on, and it's, <laughs> there's so much to say. Yeah. And important messages for today about the status of women uh, and also the freedom of expression, which we must always fight for. Yes. And so, ladies, I thank you so much. And thanks to our audience out there. Please join us again. And we look forward to uh, furthering the conversation. Thank you. So, it's a, a pleasure. Thank you. thank you, Laura. Thank you, Pam. Pleasure thank you, too. Heather. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you, and thank you, everyone, for being with us. Thank you. Okay. Join us again, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>